Hello, everyone. My name is Assemblymember Mark Berman, and I represent the 24th Assembly District in the California State Assembly, which includes Northern Santa Clara County and Southern San Mateo County. Hello, Thank you all for tuning in to my COVID-19 Vaccine and Public Health Orders Town Hall. It is my hope today to get all of you some very timely and locally relevant information. I wanna start off by thanking all of our essential workers, those who aren't able to do their job from behind a keyboard like I have for most of the last nine months, who kept going to work to keep us cared for, safe, fed, clean, and so much more. I also wanna thank everyone who has continued to follow social distancing orders. Yesterday was the nine month anniversary of the first Bay Area stay at home order. Yesterday was also a grim day in California as we shattered prior records for most new reported cases and deaths, records that had been established only earlier this week. This has gone on longer than any of us hoped it would, and I know fatigue is setting in, but the infection is more widespread than it has ever been in our community, so it is imperative that we continue to follow public health orders. The regional stay-at-home order, which is now in effect across all Bay Area counties, is meant to help slow the surge and prevent overwhelming regional ICU capacity in our hospitals. The Bay Area's ICU availability is 13.1%, and as a result, the regional stay-at-home order will take effect tonight at 11.59 p.m. In addition to Santa Clara County and the other counties that proactively implemented the state's stay-at-home order earlier in December, this will now impact San Mateo, Napa, Santa Cruz, and Solano counties, all of whom fall into the Bay Area region. I know this is tough, especially over the holidays. My mom's birthday is on Sunday. She's turning 39, again. She lives a mile away from me. I'm sorry, mom, I love you, but I'm not coming over to celebrate because I wanna be able to celebrate your 39th birthday again next year and the year after and the year after that. While this is the scariest period in terms of COVID spread, it's one of the most exciting times in the sense that we are starting to receive a vaccine and can see the light at the end of the tunnel. California has received 327,000 doses of the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine. In this initial distribution, San Mateo County is receiving 5,850 doses and Santa Clara County is receiving 17,500 doses. Even more vaccines from a second vaccine producer, Moderna, are expected to arrive in late December. And, and I know there's been a lot of exciting news about the Moderna vaccine just this afternoon. These initial doses will be provided to healthcare workers and long-term care residents. The full vaccine distribution list has not been fully finalized. The federal government is issuing recommendations on whom to vaccinate first and how to allocate the initial doses. And the final decisions and logistics are left up to states. While the goal is to get everyone vaccinated as quickly as possible, the single greatest barrier right now is the lack of vaccine availability. The state hopes to receive 2.1 million doses in total before the end of the year, but we have roughly 2.4 million healthcare workers who fall under the first phase for vaccine prioritization in California and a total population of about 40 million people. So it will take quite some time before everyone gets a vaccine. California's plan for the distribution and administration of a COVID-19 vaccine is guided by three overarching principles. Ensuring the COVID-19 vaccine meets safety requirements, ensuring the vaccine is distributed and administered equitably, at first to those with the highest risk of becoming infected and spreading COVID-19, and ensuring transparency. A drafting guidelines work group is developing California-specific guidance for the prioritization and allocation of vaccines while supplies are limited. The second phase, phase 1B, is expected to encompass roughly 8 million people, potentially including teachers, farm workers, grocery workers, and others. The state will be finalizing these plans in the coming weeks. To ensure that the COVID-19 vaccines meet safety requirements, California formed a scientific safety review work group composed of nationally recognized immunization, public health and academic experts. The work group is staying abreast of vaccine candidate trials, evidence of safety and efficacy, and other important information to independently provide recommendations to California leadership 
on vaccine planning efforts, as well as ensure public confidence in vaccine safety, efficacy, and implementation efforts. We are so very fortunate to have a member of the Scientific Safety Review Workgroup, Dr. Bonnie Maldonado, with us today. Dr. Maldonado is a professor and chief of the Division of Infectious Diseases at the Department of Pediatrics at Stanford University School of Medicine. She is also the Senior Associate Dean for Faculty Development and Diversity at the Stanford School of Medicine. Dr. Maldonado graduated from Stanford University School of Medicine before becoming a pediatric resident and fellow in pediatric infectious diseases at Johns Hopkins Hospital. Dr. Maldonado then served as an officer in the Public Health Service and the Epidemiology Intelligence Service for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. She has led a number of NIH, CDC, USAID, Gates Foundation, and World Health Organization funded domestic and international pediatric vaccine studies, as well as studies in prevention and treatment of perinatal HIV infection in the US, India, Mexico, and Africa. Dr. Maldonado has over 10 clinical epidemiology and laboratory-based studies in this area and is involved in epi epidemiologic modeling at the university, state, and national level. Dr. Maldonado is the chair of the American Academy of Pediatrics Committee on Infectious Diseases, a member of the Infectious Diseases Society of America, the Society for Pediatric Research, the Pediatric Infectious Diseases Society, the Society for Healthcare Epidemiology of America, and the American Public Health Association. She is a member of the board of the Pediatric Infectious Diseases Society, and previously a member of the Board of Scientific Counselors for the Office of Infectious Diseases at the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. So thank you so much for being here, Dr. No Dr. Maldonado. I can only imagine how busy you are right now. Thank you for inviting me. For everyone watching on Facebook Live, my staff is monitoring the comments for questions. They will try to answer quick questions directly and they'll send me questions for myself and Dr. Maldonado to answer uh, towards the end of the town hall. We also have received over 60 great questions ahead of time from constituents who have already sent their questions in. I've answered some of these questions in my introductory comments, and we'll get to as many others as possible in the time we have. So, uh, Dr. Maldonado, in, in my introduction for you, I read off your many impressive positions and qualifications, uh, but it might have been a bit difficult for folks at home or those who don't work in the health sector to follow. So in as layman's terms as possible, what makes you an expert on vaccines? Well, um, first of all, I'm a pediatrician and pediatricians give a lot of vaccines. We know a lot about vaccines in our regular day-to-day -day life, but I also study uh, vaccine preventable diseases. I study outbreaks in the US, but mostly in developing settings. I've worked, for example, in understanding cholera, Ebola, malaria, HIV, and other diseases um, uh, that some are vaccine preventable and others are not. So my work is really as a disease, um, de disease detective, basically. And just by chance, um, the virus I work with most uh, in recent years has been polio virus, which is also mm a single-stranded RNA virus. It's very similar in structure to this coronavirus. So I happen to have a laboratory and clinical research in this area uh, of looking at these kinds of viruses. So it was uh, very familiar to me in terms of the way these viruses can be spread. Um, and, uh, and so I was learning along with everybody else, but I had a chance to bring some previous information and knowledge about viruses like this. And, and we're lucky that you, you're in our backyard at Stanford University and, and here in California. Uh, and you're a member of Governor Newsom's Scientific Safety Review Work Group. Can you tell us a little bit about the process the group has undertaken to review the vaccines that are out there, Pfizer, Moderna, and, and others? Yeah, so um, uh, that task force is, mo is made up of people, as you alluded to before, who have been involved with vaccines in one way or another uh, for many years. So I know many of the people on the task force, um, we've all worked with vaccines over many, many years. And um, what we did actually is got, we started to get together over a month ago now, and we've had a number of meetings just trying to outline what our approach was gonna be, uh, what messages we wanted to send uh, to the governor to make sure we were helping him uh, get the communication out around COVID vaccines. But primarily, 
what we wanted to focus on was making sure that people and the governor understand whether we have concerns uh, not only about the safety of the vaccines, but also about the way that these vaccines were studied. Because remember, mm -hmm. at the beginning of the summer, many of us were concerned that there would be major shortcuts in the way the vaccines were going to be studied, in the way the information was going to be put out to us. We weren't we were not sure that we would be getting the full information. And many of us wrote letters um, to Operation Warp Speed, to Health and Human Services at the federal level and, and other levels to make sure that they understood that um, we as uh, pro providers would want to know this information before we recommended anything to our, our patients and their families. And so it was very clear from the beginning that we needed to send a message from California and now also Nevada, Washington and Oregon, that we are watching the process and we wanna make sure that we agree with the way the process is working uh, around judging the safety and effectiveness and efficacy of these vaccines. And, and that's so important. Uh, I know that's a huge concern and, and kind of brings me to my next question, which is, are the vaccines safe and, and are they effective from what you've seen? Yeah, so we, uh, so actually, I don't know if this was in response to our letters, but frankly, uh, the two companies that have vaccines that have already now been reviewed by the FDA, that is Pfizer and Moderna and other companies, they actually were very transparent. They posted in, over the summer, posted their protocols um, online for people to see. They were really pretty transparent about showing data. Um, and so we had a, a quick peek at what these vaccines might be looking like over the summer, but it wasn't until last week and then just this today that we got to see all of the data um, from the FDA and the company. And it's important to note that um, before we go into the safety, that many countries have already approved vaccines. For example, um, there's a vaccine that was manufactured in China that more than a million people have already received. And I imagine that it's a good vaccine, I, but I wouldn't know because we don't have any data to mm -hmm. look at. And so um, we in the US are very fortunate that our system really does depend on transparency and our ability to see the numbers, see what happened, see how people made decisions, and then let us make our own decisions about how we feel. Fortunately, uh, most people do depend on, because of this trust, they depend on us to be able to um, to, to, to give them the information and, and, and people believe that what we've seen is right. But these vaccines are, are, are very, very safe. Um, mm. There are a couple of caveats um, that I can mention, but basically they are very safe. The data was actually stunning in terms of how effective they were, how the efficacy was almost twice as high as anything that anybody would have expected from these <laughs> vaccines. And the safety events were what you would expect to see with any other vaccine that's given um, to the general population. Sorry, give me that, repeat that last part. You said the, the safety events are safety, what you'd expect? Yeah, the safety signals very, seem very similar to what we would see with any other vaccine. So for example, what we saw was <clears throat> that both vaccines have a pretty substantial uh, local reaction. So you get a pretty sore arm. Many of the mm -hmm. people, most people actually had a very sore arm, which is what we see with a lot of other vaccines. And about 10 to 40% of people would develop uh, a mild, um, uh, mild headaches, fatigue. Uh, so mild flu-like illness for about 24 to 48 hours after the vaccination. And that's not always unusual with some of the vaccines that we've seen today. So those were really the major um, safety um, events that we saw. And those seem to be in line with what we see with other vaccines that are given um, uh, to people and indicate in, in many ways that these are vaccines that are mounting, for which you're mounting an immune response. Got you. So that's just your body reacting and, and creating that immune response, which is what we want. Yeah, exactly. So, and then that sounds a lot like, you know, when I get my flu shot, my arm hurts and, and I know sometimes I might feel a little bit sick afterwards, but uh, you know, that's, that just means that it's working. And so are those are the main, and, and you, you use the term safety events, uh, which I think to me is side effects. Um, those are the main kind of side effects that we've seen from the COVID-19 vaccine so far. Yeah, so the, the side effects that we're seeing were primarily, the, the biggest ones of course, were the uh, pain at the site of injection. 
Yeah. Um, and then very little redness or swelling. It's really just the pain. And then mild flu-like symptoms, um, again, between 10 and 40% of people. Now, some of the concerns that came up there were since the first uh, group of people, the first phase includes healthcare workers, is not to vaccinate all people in one unit at the same time because mm. we want to be able to make sure, for example, that if somebody wants to stay home because they don't feel well, that everyone in the in that particular unit doesn't uh, feel poorly for a day or so and is out all at one time. So we're trying to make sure that um, we stagger the administration of the vaccine. So logistically, it's a little more complicated than than one might have kind of hoped, but you know, not and not I, that big of a deal. Part of it is because everybody's going to be vaccinated. So usually with flu, you kind of say, okay, from September to March, go ahead and get mm. vaccinated. And people don't always get vaccinated on the same day. But here, because of the way it's being phased out, you know, there people are lining up, and I, and as I uh, may have mentioned to you earlier, we're seeing a pretty big uptake if you um, look mm -hmm. at our we have an electronic medical record approach and, and, and virtually everybody wants to be vaccinated who's signed up who are healthcare workers at, at facilities where I've, where I've spoken. Which, so, is, which is so, oh, sorry, go ahead. I think people just have questions and once they have their questions answered, they all wanna sign up. Um, so it is exciting to see that. Very exciting. Cause I know that's, that was a big unknown kind of going into this is how many people would and then people need to feel comfortable. Like you said, they have questions. They, they just like we wanted you to see the information from uh, the manufacturers, uh, you know, the pharmaceutical industry or, or companies. We, as, as, as the public want to get some answers maybe before we do something like this. And um, hopefully tonight's event helps give some people those, th those answers. Um, how, well, let me ask this. Are there any groups that the vaccine is not yet determined to be safe for? So children or pregnant women or breastfeeding mothers? Yeah, so uh, one of the vaccines has, uh, they uh, was approved for use in, in people as young as 16. And they did include some 16 and 17 year olds. Most of the vac the other two vaccines, the, the vaccines are have primarily been given in 18 years, in 18 year olds and older. But the Pfizer vaccine did have some 16 and 17 year olds, but the trials in kids younger than 16 are just starting now. So okay. uh, there are trials now in 12 to 15 year olds, and then we'll see how that goes. And then probably at younger ages as well, because it's likely that all age groups will need to be vaccinated down the line. Um, there are some issues around the immunocompromised person, people who are on immunomodulator therapy. So for example, Humira or other products, Remicade, um, or who are on cancer chemotherapy. And the issue there is actually not the safety because the vaccine actually works in a way that is extremely safe. Um, it's really the issue of whether or not somebody's immune system is still in the process of, for example, re re recovering from chemotherapy and whether they will make any immune response right away or whether they should wait a little bit. So those are really the issues that uh, people are dealing with as to whether or not they think the immune system is is ready to be able to mount a good um, antibody response. Um, the ACOG, the American uh, College of Obstetrics and Gynecology and the Society for Maternal and Fetal Medicine um, did get together with uh, me as a member of the Amer American Academy of Pediatrics and the CDC and we went over the Pfizer vaccine and nobody had concerns um, from, the, from those uh, uh, placental uh, experts, people like expert on on fetal fetuses and and pregnancy and 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 placentas and placental interactions, and they felt uh, very comfortable with this vaccine. So it is um, a, pregnant women are allowed to get the vaccine, and that's very important because especially in this first line, uh, many of the healthcare workers, as you mentioned, um, we have over two million healthcare workers in the state and twenty million uh, in nationwide. Many are women, many are women of childbearing age. So um, the vaccine was not thought to be um, unsafe. So it's thought to be very safe and that women and pregnant women, pregnant, lactating and breastfeeding women could also get the vaccine. Awesome, awesome. There were, we had a couple of questions from, from constituents who were you know, concerned about that. So that's really, really good to hear. Um, how were the vaccines able to be developed so quickly and, 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 and yet safely? You know, this seems like almost a, a, a modern day miracle considering how things have gone in the past. 
You know, it's really, I mean, even for me, I, I've been working with vaccines for many, many years and I'm, it's astounding. But, and that's part of the, it's, it's exciting to see that. But at the same time, for many of us, we, we were worried, well, how can you make a vaccine that's mm -hmm. safe and effective so quickly? But that's why it was really helpful to see the company show us the data. So it turns out that the platform, the mechanism here is actually quite straightforward. So, uh, and also there was so much money, as you know, it was billions of dollars were put into this. So it just goes to show you that when the resources are made available, you can really build something out very quickly uh, when you have the right technology. So it turns out that this virus is a uh, coronavirus mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, there are seven coronaviruses and four of them are normal seasonal cold viruses. They just cause colds, but they have, they all have, you've seen the cartoons of them. They all have these spikes on them. And it turns out the reason it's been thankfully straightforward uh, so far to make these vaccines is that you just have to make uh, antibodies or immunity to those little spikes because the spikes are the way the virus sticks to the human cell and gets into the cell and causes all the damage that we see. So, it, and it, I mean, we were all very pleasantly surprised, but it turns out if you make antibodies just to that little spike, then you can be protected against infection by that cell. Now I say that because for many vaccines, for example, for pertussis, you need antibodies to at least five different parts of the mm. bacteria in order to have some degree of immunity. So it's not always that simple. For this particular virus, it turns out it was actually quite easy because there's just one protein that you need to target. And so this platform, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine both use a brand new platform that has not actually been licensed before, but was very promising. People just hadn't been interested enough in the platform to use it in a new way. So it was actually already sitting there waiting to be used. Um, and with all of the resources, they were able to build it out very quickly. So what it is, is essentially the, um, the, nucle the genetic code for that spike protein is not DNA in this virus, because this is an RNA virus. It's a little piece of RNA that they manufacture. So it doesn't even come from live virus and you manufacture it so that it, it's actually the code that would produce the protein that we call the spike protein. And what happens is this little piece of DNA RNA is encased in an oil layer and um, mm -hmm. is injected into your arm. The oil actually helps it get absorbed into the cells in your arm, the muscle cells in your arm. And then the oil falls off. The little RNA piece has a little tail on it that normal, they all do in, even in our normal human cells. And this tail is recognized by these things called ribosomes that they stick mm -hmm. to that tail and they immediately start reading across the RNA and creating the proteins. It's called translation. They make proteins. That's what they do for all of our cells. And so they find this RNA, they stick to the RNA, they make proteins, and that's all just spike protein. And then the, the RNA falls apart and it degrades, it's gone. It doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't get into your DNA. Mm. It just dissolves and it, it falls apart. The, the cell, the cell d d um, takes it apart. Now you've got all of these little spike proteins that, that the, uh, the ribosomes and the RNA have constructed and you make a lot, it turns out a lot of it is made inside the cell. What happens is really interesting is then that spike protein sticks out of your own normal human cell. So now hmm. essentially your cell has, looks like a coronavirus to the, your immune system. And so then your body's immune system comes in and attacks that spike protein makes antibodies to it and then kills the cell. So not, not your cell wouldn't be able to, uh, you know, produce the symptoms of a coronavirus because it's not a coronavirus. It's a human mm -hmm. cell that's disguised as a coronavirus, basically with these spike proteins. But, but now you've, you've been able to kill the cell and make immunity to it. So in killing the cell, your body has also developed a, an ability to recognize how to kill cells that mm -hmm. look like so you have two different ways of attacking the real virus when it comes along. One is to make antibodies to stick to the virus so it doesn't stick to your cells. And the other is that the other killer T, we call them T cells, the kill, the, they will recognize that virus also and come in 
and destroy it. So it is a very robust response. And because all you have to do is make this small piece of RNA, um, it is actually very fast. You can make this much more quickly than our tra traditional and conventional vaccines. So that's why it happened so quickly. That, and these um, companies actually, because they enrolled patients all over the world, they were able to enroll almost three quarters of a million patients mm. uh, in, in a matter of months. So they enrolled patients over two months or so, and they've been able to follow them out between two and three months now for evidence of, in, of uh, safety and efficacy. That's, that's absolutely fascinating, scientifically amazing. And folks at home, there will be a test <laughs> after the town hall. Uh, how long, speaking of, of following, you know, and in, in, in the fact that it's fantastic that three quarters of a million people have already received the vaccine, how long does the immunity from the vaccine last? Or do we know yet? Yeah, so that's a really important area that we don't know because, you know, coming back to this rapidity, so the virus really has only, it really only started to become a, a problem in China, we think last year. So some mm -hmm. people think it was as early as September. Some people think it was more uh, closer to this time of the year. But in any event, it hasn't been around very long. And we have only really had the, vi the, the virus itself here in the US less than, less than nine or 10 months. So, mm -hmm. the, so the vaccine trials started in earnest, say in July. So we really only have six months of data so far. Um, there is evidence from other um, coronaviruses that immunity to the coronaviruses can last a couple of years, maybe longer, but there's also evidence that we can get reinfected with them over time uh, because how many times have you gotten a cold, right? So mm -hmm. about 30% of the colds that we get are from these, this family of viruses. So we don't really know yet, but um, it's possible that we will need to get boosters every so often. Um, and that's one thing that the companies, the FDA and the CDC will be following over time. How long does it take for there to be breakthrough infections or hopefully there won't be, but, it, but, but likely there will be some breakthrough and, and that'll be a big area of study. Mm. The other thing um, people will be interested in, which is sim a similar uh, important question is, um, this, these studies really primarily looked at symptomatic disease, so reduction of symptomatic disease. Um, they didn't look at asymptomatic disease. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't know, for example, if it prevents somebody from getting sick with no symptoms and then serving potentially as a, a, a way to transmit to others. So that piece is important. It's almost as important because now we know you can be protected but what if you spread to other people mm -hmm. and still have to keep wearing masks and all of that? So um, it's that's another um, area that the companies are going to try to figure out. And the reason they haven't done it yet is because they wanted to get these vaccines at least into people to prevent serious disease. Um, and then hopefully they can also study whether we can prevent transmission, because if you can prevent transmission, then we could start taking our masks off and, you know, the distancing wouldn't have to be enforced so uh, rigorously. So that, that, that brings up another question that we got, um, which I think I now have a better understanding of, which is how long after, after receiving the vaccine, either as an individual or, or maybe even more importantly, just as a society, can we start to resume normal life? And it sounds like not immediately necessarily because we don't, nec we don't know. Yeah, well, I mean, I think we can start getting back. So right now, and I won't, you know, as you all know, it is really a bad time. Um, mm. our hospitals are full. I mean, we're, as you know, better than I, our ICU capacity is in uh, double digits in both counties right now. Uh, we've never seen the, these few beds. I mean, we're, our hospital, we're taking transfers from other places mm -hmm. where they just don't have any more ICU beds. And, you know, the, the idea of not having a bed, you know, you see on television people in the hallways and certainly we could, we can do that. It's not really a matter of the bed per se, but it's how many staff members mm -hmm. can really take care of all those people. And we are already just working at full capacity. Um, people are pretty tired. They're working really hard. Um, 
you know, even with the PPE and all that, I think we've kind of all gotten used to that. I just came back from another place where I was trying to rush home so I, I could talk to you without wearing my N95. But, um, you know, we're all wearing all of the um, full gear. That's not as hard. I mean, it's not easy, but the hard part is just the just the sheer volume mm. of patients. And so, um, so I think that part will get better. So we're bad right now, but I think this lockdown will help us because... We just need to start staying apart from one another. The good news there is that if, when you see what happened in Europe, they had a big spike also. They started to lock down and within a couple of weeks, they really started to see a reduction. And I'm hoping that we'll see that, but unfortunately I don't think it's gonna happen until early January. So we're gonna have a tough season ahead of us. Uh, but again, the hope with the vaccine is that if we can at least protect people over time and what we're hoping is that the general public will get the vaccine in spring and healthcare mm -hmm. workers will be able to get, I, we think all of our healthcare workers in the US will be vaccinated by the end of January. Mm. So then we can start in January, February, and we're gonna talk about this on Sunday with the CDC, who are our essential workers? So who will be mm. in line? We're gonna start to get them vaccinated February, March, and then the general public, maybe March, April. So we're hoping that by spring, um, there should be at least um, less concern about rapid transmission among all of our communities. So I do think that even though we'll be wearing masks and distancing for some months to come, we'll be able to start opening up again. But people just really need to be careful. They just need to wear the masks and be distanced. There are some studies that show that not wearing a mask all the that wearing a mask sometimes is as effective as not wearing one at all. So if you're gonna, you know, go into a room with other people and sometimes wear the mask and other times not, then it's not really helpful. You know, your risk of getting infected or infecting others is gonna be the same. So it's not a big, um, real big ask, but it's, a, yeah. it's an important one. So I do think that over the su of spring and summer, things will get better. Um, and then by the fall, we'll just have to see. I'm hoping that if we can get uh, our vaccine trials uh, done fast enough, um, that we could even have children safely vaccinated and go back to school. Which would be, as, as, as parents across the world know, a huge deal um, for, for the ability for, for that, you know, everybody to be, for, for kids to be able to get educated properly, um, for teachers to be able to teach in the way that they best know how, and then for people to be able to get back to work and, and our economy to be able to open up again, which will be so important. Now you mentioned, you don't think that we'll see things start to kind of, um, calm down until early January. Is that because you're worried that, that people are going to just keep on getting together over the holidays or what's the, well, What's part the, of it is it takes about two weeks for you to really, you know, once you're exposed, you can, you actually don't get sick for maybe five to seven to 10 days. And so today people are getting sick today may have been exposed in the last week or two. So, and we know, I can just tell you right now from having been over at the COVID tent, I was where we were taking care of patients this morning. I mean, there, it's not stopping. There's just a mm. lot of people coming in. And they're infectious and they're, you know, if they're infectious in their families and right now, most of the transmission is happening in households because it's so uh, widespread now and people uh, can't always afford to stay in a hotel for 10 days while they're uh, trying to isolate. And even if they mm -hmm. isolate their room, that's helpful, but not everybody has the luxury of having their own bedroom to isolate in. So I just think right now, and also because it's cold and uh, mm -hmm. winter time, people are more closely packed. So I just think there's just logistically, there's going to be a lot of crowding and uh, we know there's a lot of infection. So I think that even if today, if everybody was completely isolated, it would still be another two weeks for sh right now before we yep. see it drop off because people would be getting infected today. Yep. So I think it will be a couple of weeks at least. And then, um, and then we'll see what happens Christmas and New Year's. I mean, that's what I'm also yeah. working on, as you alluded to. Yeah. So, and, and just, uh, you know, a reminder for folks for, who might have missed my talking points at the beginning, please do not get together with anybody outside of your household uh, during the holiday season. I know it sucks. Uh, tonight's the eighth night of Hanukkah. We have Christmas coming up. There's New Year's. There's lots of other holidays. Um, but getting COVID and, and, and potentially dying is, 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 sucks a lot more. 
than not being able to be in person with with your family and loved ones and friends over the holidays. So please, 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 please do not gather with people outside of your household um, over the next couple of weeks, especially when COVID is so widespread throughout our communities. Um, so we've had a lot of questions from constituents and you alluded to this earlier, but you want to, constituents who have sent in very specific cases wanting to know when they will personally be able to get vaccinated. Mm -hmm. um, and we know that healthcare professionals and those living and working in senior care facilities are the first tier. When do you think we'll know when the others, um, when, when, when do you think we will know when others will receive the vaccine? I, I don't necessarily, I'm not asking, you know, if I'm 40 years old with, with no health issues and, and what, but just generally, when do you think that we'll have that information? Yeah, so we, we don't have it now. I, I'm again, uh, one of the CDC committees that I'm on, we've been basically meeting since June to try to figure this all out. So we have a pretty good idea. And as you said, um, uh, there are there will be CDC guidance, but every state will decide mm -hmm. with a very granular uh, detail what exactly that means. So, for example, we uh, decided um, what how would you attack a disease like this? Well, the first thing you need to do is you need to keep your healthcare systems alive because mm -hmm. we need to take care of the people who are sick with this disease, but we also need to take care of people who are coming in with heart attacks, strokes. Um, accidents, um, all kinds of other diseases. I mean, we are seeing, and you've probably seen this in, in the newspaper, but uh, the, um, the impact of this pandemic on other diseases has been very strong mm -hmm. because a lot of people are avoiding going in to see their doctor, going in to, to make appointments, at, and they're actually late, delayed cancer diagnosis, delayed treatment of heart attacks, et cetera, has been happening, and those are leading to worse outcomes. So we want to make sure that we keep our healthcare system safe so that we can keep people alive until this pandemic is over. And in order to do that, we need to keep healthcare workers safe and healthy. So we felt that it was somewhat self-serving, but really what we were trying to do, like we did um, two th in 2009 with the pan H flu pandemic, uh, the, uh, the influenza pandemic, was to make sure that the healthcare workers didn't get sick. Because if you start to go home and, and you can't work, you, you don't want, you can't shut a hospital down. That's just, just yeah. can't happen. I just can't imagine that happening. So we need to keep the healthcare workers sick, especially the frontline workers. Mm -hmm. There needs to be equity. So it can't just be the doctors and the nurses. It has to be the food service people, the transporters, the people who park your cars, all those people, because um, they may not have the same access um, to medical services and they may actually have higher risk because they may be living in situations where they have crowded homes or mm. have to take public transportation. So we wanted it to be in a very equitable distribution, but healthcare workers and residents of long-term care facilities. So those are the two groups that go first and, and or to, are tiered first. And the reason for the long-term care facilities, they make up 40% of the deaths Mm -hmm. in this country so far from this disease, which is now, as you may have heard today, the number one cause of death in the country right now, mm -hmm. COVID, above heart disease and cancer. And so we want to make sure that those individuals, not only can we keep them alive, but they also, from a very practical standpoint, they take up bed space in the hospital mm -hmm. and they get sick. So to keep the hospitals open, to keep the healthcare workers seeing patients that they need to see, that's the first group that will be vaccinated. And that's what's happening this week and will continue to happen. But on Sunday, we're gonna go back and look at the second tier, which is 1B, which will be essential workers and first responders. So firefighters, police, um, our police uh, forces. And then, as you mentioned, all the other primary services, people who maintain our water supply, mm -hmm. people who maintain the electrical grid, Mm -hmm. uh, grocery uh, people who keep our food on the table we have to have all of those things to su survive as well so they'll be next and yeah. how exactly that's broken up will really depend on each state and then gotcha. after that with the next tier will be people over 65 and people with underlying health conditions and then finally after that will be the general population so that's why i said mostly we will get to that healthy general population, probably by March or April, just because we know that the companies are trying to ramp up their production of vaccine 
Uh, but of course, you know, it, you know, we're talking about millions and millions of doses. Yeah, and just logistically getting everybody vaccinated that quickly is a, is a, is a huge lift. Um, one question on, on that note, will individuals have control over which manufacturer they get vaccinated with? So can, can I go in and say, I want Pfizer over Moderna or as other ones come, uh, yeah, you know, come online? I, I don't really know the answer. I suspect that you will at some point in time. Right now, we're just, I have to say that we just got the Pfizer vaccine. Mm -hmm. It was approved Oh, it was approved uh, last uh, last Friday, so almost a week ago, and now we've already got it sitting in our freezer. So that is, uh, and people are just they they can't they can't get there fast enough to get vaccinated. So right now, people are gonna are going for the Pfizer vaccine. The Moderna will probably be available soon, but there are four other vaccines that are being studied that should be ready for FDA review by the beginning of the year. They're not mRNA vaccines. They're uh, live virus vaccines. One of them is a live virus vaccine and another one is a traditional um, protein vaccine, um, but they're going to take a little while. I suspect those vaccines won't be ready and approved for use by March or April. So it could be that by the time the general public has access to vaccines, there may be more than just these two available. So I suspect, you know, it, it'll depend on what the state allocation looks like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Um, and, and, and this is a logistical question. So please, you know, if you don't know the answer, let me know and we can let folks know uh, afterwards. But how will people be notified that they are eligible to be vaccinated? And, and do they call their primary care physician? Do they stroll into the local CVS like you can to get a flu shot? How, how logistically does that work? Well, the governor actually does have another committee and he's got a lot, of course, of many, many different task forces at this point. One of them is the Community Engagement Task Force and mm -hmm. they are working on that right now. And I think what they call it is Vaccinate All 58 and it's mm -hmm. in all 58 counties in California. So every state will have its own messaging. Of course, at the federal level, the FDA and the CDC will put out their guidelines, but that will really help mostly to guiding the state leadership on how to get the vaccine out. It's really gonna depend on the states for example, mm -hmm. as you know well, um, Governor Newsom has really handed over a lot of the authority to the counties themselves. Mm -hmm. So I suspect that the counties in California will be responsible for messaging. And I think this is where we really do need community engagement. Well, we're gonna need to get out to those communities that maybe aren't quite as engaged in social media or may not really have time to think about this. And so uh, there's already been a lot of engagement with community-based organizations, mm -hmm. making sure that everybody knows. And of course, the you know outpatient providers are gonna be hearing about this now so they can reach out to their patients and say, listen, that you'll probably get messages um, uh, down the line. So I do think it's gonna be, as you said, uh, logistically gonna be um, very complicated, uh, but I think each state will have its own approach. Mm. And, and you're so right in terms of the communication and reaching some of those hard to, reach communities. I, I led the state's census efforts for the past three years. And we're just transitioning a lot of those strategies to, to, you know, getting information out about the vaccine because it's reaching some of those, we call them hard to count communities. Yeah. Now it might be hard to vaccinate right. communities um, to make sure. And it strikes to the equity issues that you were talking about earlier. Yeah. So, th one that's of the, so one of the things that I did um, before COVID was I worked in international sites mostly. In fact, you know, I haven't been on an airplane since February and a lot of my research has come to a grinding halt in mm -hmm. other countries, but I also realized they're probably busy dealing with the pandemic. But we also, at that point, trying to vaccinate children um, in, in areas that were really uh, rural and maybe difficult to reach, um, we called that, and you probably heard this, the last mile. So how do you mm -hmm. do the last mile? Um, that's going to be important because we want everyone to have be offered the protection if they want it and we hope that people do want it to be protected against this virus but also we're going to need about 50 to 70 percent of the U.S. population to be immune in order mm -hmm. to get what we call herd immunity so fortunately the vaccines these two vaccines seem to work well enough that 50 to 70 percent of people if they get vaccinated it will just reduce the risk of people coming into contact with others with the virus. So 
We hope the number is higher than that, uh, but, but at least initially we'll be able to see some reductions, but we're gonna need to get the word out, especially in communities where the risk is higher for transmission. For example, we know that areas uh, where people live in more dense housing mm -hmm. are very high risk. Mm -hmm. People that have to work in frontline uh, places with not adequate PPE um, are very high risk as well. And so we need to be careful there. The also the other population, and I um, you, you probably know this also, is that young people, uh, meaning 18 to 35 year olds are also, um, or before this particular surge, they were the highest risk mm -hmm. group. And part of that, I think, although I don't know for sure, but some of it was you know, that's a group that doesn't tend to get as sick. They, you know, it's like a mild flu or it can be more severe. Although we do know that these, these are individuals who can be hospitalized and, and get quite ill. In our hospital, we had, at one point, most of our patients were in that age group. So mm. it isn't a, a zero risk, um, but I think um, they, they, you know, they might feel, well, I, I might not get sick at all, or I might get mildly sick. And that, may be true for the for many of many people in that age group but they might get somebody else sick who might get mm -hmm. somebody else sick who will then have a, a person at risk get very sick and die and the sad thing is that um, two or three generations of transmission is really uh, an unintended consequence but it's real to the person who who gets sick and dies and they never it, really knew what hit them absolutely it, it's you know you, it's selfish to, to think that I can get COVID and it wouldn't be that big of a, a deal um, to, because of your point, uh, which is it's just way too easy to transmit it to somebody else, somebody you probably love. And, and um, you know, that's what I've heard also is that so many of the cases are coming from gatherings yeah. and you're not gathering with strangers, you're gathering with friends, you're gathering with family. And then those people are getting sick because maybe you were asymptomatic. Um, and then those people are ending up in the hospital. And, and I um, couldn't imagine what that would feel like if you knew that you got, you know, your parent sick or, or your grandparents sick. So you also talked, uh, I want to ask a quick question that came up actually uh, in the, in the, in the chat during our, our, our chat, um, which is that the, a lot of the spikes are happening in, in communities of color. Somebody asked, are there differences in vaccine, in vaccine effectiveness for people of color? That's a great question. We did make sure, um, you know, I think this summer taught us a lot about um, uh, equity and mm -hmm. about health disparities. I think um, this is, a, as you mentioned, this is my other role. I work in a de faculty development, but also around diversity and diverse mm -hmm. and inclusive environments, not just for our faculty, but remember, I also see patients. So I, run, I work with, as, a, as a teacher and a researcher, but I see patients and we need to make sure that when we see our patients that we're also being inclusive. And so one of the areas there that we really under, we saw was that um, we were, um, we were um, very insistent that the companies include communities of color. Mm. Traditionally, most clinical studies for any disease are not diverse populations. And if you think about it, um, those are populations for whom it might be hard to get enrolled in a trial. They might not hear about trials. They might not know what they are. They don't have the time or the, you know, they may be working multiple jobs and just can't get away. And trials do take a little more time, you know, out of your day. You have, mm -hmm. to, and, and many times there may not be a direct benefit to you. So um, it's very hard to include people of color or people from low socioeconomic groups into trials when they really don't have the time. The other issue that's come up is um, that people are mistrustful of the system. The system mm -hmm. has not treated them well, so they don't really want to get involved. They don't want to be experimented on. And that's there have been very good examples of where that has happened. So we have really made an effort to engage in our communities here in the Bay Area. I've worked very closely with some of the federally qualified health centers, helping them do testing and um, helping them get access to care. But uh, we really wanted these companies to be very aware, and the FDA was very clear that if they didn't make sure that they had diverse populations in their trials, that they wouldn't be considered seriously. So they did make an effort, and um, in one, um, and at least twenty-five percent of the of the people in both trials were people of color. Mm. And it turns out that the vaccine worked just as well in those populations as it did in the in the. Um, 
non-minority population. Um, good. So, so far, the numbers are looking good across gender, uh, sex, uh, uh, race, ethnicity, age, um, people who have underlying uh, uh, medical conditions. So, so far, these vaccines are working really well in every single category that, you, that we've been able to study so far. That's that's fantastic to hear, and I hope that sets a new model for for future trials. Uh, you know, for us to yeah. every time, yeah, uh, be this, yeah. This is uh, breakthrough, and that we were able to demonstrate that even during these trying times, you can mm. get people in. Now, it is it isn't easy. I mean, I and I enroll patients myself in an outpatient trial, and uh, you know, finding ways to get people in who don't have a car, for example, or have to, you know, have to work, et cetera, all of those things, we, but we have to do it if we want to make sure that everyone has equal access uh, to treatments that work in their populations. And, and it just increases that faith that, you know, no corners were cut, uh, that, that this is, you know, that these vaccines are, are safe for every community. There's a quick question came in that I, I want to read, and then I'm going to give a quick answer uh, and then ask you another question, Dr. Maldonado. Somebody asked, I read that residents of long-term care homes are in group 1A. Does that include assisted living? And how will this group of people be notified of their vaccination? The answer is yes, assisted living facilities are included in phase 1A. The Santa Clara and San Mateo County Public Health Departments will work directly with facilities to vaccinate their residents. So just in case folks, yeah, I mean, clearly people uh, had questions about that. Want to make sure that, that people got that answer. Dr. Maldonado, will survivors of COVID-19 get the vaccine and is it safe for them to do so? Yeah, so um, the, 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 both of the trials, so the answer is yes, they can do that and it does appear to say, be safe. So when uh, people were enrolled in the trial, they did uh, get a baseline uh, antibody tests on people and then enroll them. Some of the individuals had evidence of prior infection mm -hmm. um, and they uh, did just as well in the trials, although the ma majority, they wanted the majority of people not to have had previous infection but even those who had previous infection did fine. At this point, because of the ramp up of dosage availability, um, the recommendation is if you've had COVID in the last three months or so, you might wanna step to the back of the line. You don't have to, but it would be helpful. And that's because um, it's thought that um, once somebody gets infected, you might have immunity for about two or three months or so. Um, we know that there are reports of people who've gotten reinfected around four or five months out. And so we don't really have a good sense of that, but we thought if people had been recently infected, they could just wait a bit to let other people mm -hmm. get infected. But there's no hard and fast rule there. Um, good. And, and so far, it, people who've been infected and got uh, the two doses of vaccine for uh, both of the vaccines and, and didn't have any unusual side effects. Great. So... Uh uh, I'm going I'm to ask a repeat question because I know we got it a lot before the event. And I bet we we're getting a lot. You, you've already answered this, but just want to uh, give you a chance to answer it again for folks. When will the 65 plus group be in the vaccine rollout? Yeah, so I can't give you a specific date, but the way the CDC uh, set up the tiers, and by the way, just so a little bit of background here, it wasn't just the CDC deciding. This was really a number of bioethicists that got together over the spring and summer, people thinking ahead. And I'm so glad they did that because you don't wanna make these kind of decisions at the last minute when the mm. vaccine is already sitting on the shelf. So they started thinking about this back in May, June. We had meetings every month, July, August, et cetera, really going, pouring through the data. And Johns Hopkins University, um, an organization called the National Academy of Medicine um, and, um, and the CDC and others actually did put together um, expert groups that really thought hard about how would you allocate ethically a vaccine in a, in a, in a population where everybody is essentially at risk. Mm -hmm. so how do you make those decisions? And I mentioned that the way CDC decided to operationalize that was to protect the healthcare setting first, and then to protect other essential functions, and then protect the people who are at highest risk of getting sick. And so, um, so uh, rather than call it a uh, priority, because that makes it sound like people aren't getting priority, they called it um, uh, tiers or, or mm -hmm. so their phases. So the first phase, it's phase 1A, phase 1B, phase 1C, and then phase two, three. 
So phase 1A, 1B, 1C will be rapidly rolled out and we anticipate those will happen in overlapping fashion over the next couple to three months. And that's healthcare workers and residents of long-term care facilities right up front. Um, and then essential workers, and that's to be defined in, in more granularity this weekend. And I think Governor Newsom's already starting to roll that out for California. And then anybody who is 65 and older or has underlying uh, medical conditions who doesn't already fit into the first 1A or 1B, who hasn't met those criteria can then be vaccinated. So we're hoping that that can happen maybe around March or so. Uh, March, April. It really depends on how rapidly the companies can make their vaccine. And they're talking about hundreds of millions of doses in the next six months or so. And, um, and just as you just remember the other just logistical issue, we're talking about what 330 million people in the US and you need two doses. So we're going to need over half a billion doses of vaccine. Um, and so um, we, we don't have that many doses yet, but we hope we'll have maybe two to 300 million sometime between now and March. So we think there will be lots of opportunity for people over 65 and people with underlying medical conditions to be able to get vaccinated um, before springtime or in early spring. Which, which can't come soon enough, but it's so exciting to hear that we're not that far away. Um, so Dr. Molinato, I want to respect your time. I, we've got a couple of minutes left. Is there any last words of wisdom or, or things that you think people should know that we haven't covered yet? Yeah, I just want to thank everybody who's joined. And I want to thank you in particular for really hosting a town hall where people can have their questions answered. I have to say that, um, you know, I'm doing this a lot. I mean, I have other jobs too, but I've really spent a lot of time uh, with this. And um, I do, I am very hopeful that mm. we are going to get through this. And I know one of our senior leaders at the hospital says this is the dark before the dawn mm -hmm. and I really do think that the dawn is coming it's not just going to be continuously dark um and so I want people to I know this is going to be a tough season and um people are feeling the economic crunch I think their kids are probably feeling it we know that children are suffering mental health mm -hmm. issues from having to be you know not see their friends etc but this is just a tough uh, situation. We don't want to make it worse by having people get sick. Uh, we do see that really, truly a light at the end of the tunnel. I think by spring, uh, we're going to start to see things turn around. When we get through the holiday season, I think people can still go out, for example, and go hiking on their own, you know, bike riding, um, doing activities with your own pods, sticking to being creative um, in ways that, that are healthy, reach out to other people, at least uh, on the phone or however you mm. can, or if you have a pod, because this is really affecting a lot of our wellness, our mental health. And um, we just need to really uh, try to support one another. We at work, we call it, we just say, just be kind, be smart, be kind. Uh, we have to try to be kind to one another. We're all stressed out, but everybody's feeling the same way. And if anything, it should try to bring us together and try to work together and feel like we're all fighting this common enemy, which help hopefully helps bring us all together. And uh, to look to leaders like you who are gonna help us get through this. Well, I, I love that. I love be kind. Uh, I think those are words to live by uh, during COVID and, and, and after COVID. So thank you so much uh, for joining us tonight for all of the, the information and wisdom that you provided that I, I know I've really appreciated and learned a lot from. I hope we've had uh, hundreds of people RSVP for this, uh, both from in the district, outside of the district. Uh, so it's just about spreading information. So grateful to you, uh, to all of your colleagues for all the work that you are doing. Uh, I also wanna thank my staff uh, and in particular, Isabel LaSalle, who's worked so hard to make this event a success, but my whole team has been working on this, um, you know, all th through the event uh, to, to make sure that people get as much information as possible. And I, they told me to say that the videos will be saved on the website, on YouTube and on Facebook. So if you didn't catch everything, you can go back and watch it again. You can fast forward, you can rewind. Um, and don't hesitate to reach out to, to me in my office if you uh, have any trouble with with uh, any state issues uh, over the holidays, afterwards. That's what we're here for. Thank you, Dr. Maldonado, again, for taking the time tonight. Uh, and thank you, everybody, so much for joining us.